No, firstly, I would like to congratulate you, Jan, and the organizers for setting up such a magnificent, uh, a magnificent conference. I think it's a real pleasure and great opportunity to be here and share with you not only an article written by Dorte Martinsen and myself, which is uh, still not published, but hopefully will be published soon, uh, but essentially also some of the conclusions of an emerging historiography on EU law, uh, which I spent quite some time on this last decade. Um, so it's, a, it's an attempt in a way to summarize the different results which are published in various places, comes out as, as PhDs, etc., and to attempt to make a coherent interpretation or argument about the causality of the process and try to conceptualize it. But, you know, as you can see from Augustine's brilliant paper, this is just a, a first attempt, if you like, because depending on how you contextualize that story and what you bring into it, it can look different, that's for sure. But I think there are nevertheless some basic, uh, let's say, narratives and stories and, and, and causalities and facts that this new historiography have brought out, which I think uh, are worth paying attention to. So let me just, uh, before summarizing what the article argues, let me just uh, try to explain, because I think it's easy to misinterpret from many lawyers and also maybe even political scientists, what really is the nature of the article we have, we have written. Of course, if you want in one article to put a large scale historical interpretation, you fall into precisely the critique I gave you, Luke, right? That you cannot cover everything in a paper like that, and you can always come from one or another angle and say something is missing. So clearly, it's not a doctrinal history we have made. There are so many of the key judgments, they are not there. You will look for them and think, is this the history of European law? It's, it's not only, the judgments are not there. Some of them are, but not, not all the most important ones. Also, it's, uh, it's not an article that presents a normative or philosophical argument about the nature of EU law. So when we try to analyze what has happened and how the social story, if you like, history of European law has kind of en enveloped and whether the constitutional practice has been successful or not, it really is not a value judgment. You know, I can on one level argue as a, as a historian, try to interpret this and on a personal level say, okay, I love constitutionalism and I'm actually a federalist, even though I may argue that it fails as part of a history, right? So just pay attention here. I'm not, it's, a not a, it's not a historical confirmation that constitutionalization has happened in the traditional sense, all right? And then I, I think it's also a, a piece which is not a direct input to this conference as a kind of being a imagination for EU constitutionalism. And I'm here because Jan, he read the article and actually wanted it to be there. So I would say, of course, the piece is much more something that is a kind of a historical baseline that you can play with and critique uh, and think about when you imagine what EU should, constitutionalism should be. Um, so let me just briefly sum up what, uh, what we have argued. I think at the core of the article is detailed exploration on the emergence and consolidation of what we are called constitutional practice. And that is a way to describe the social phenomenon. We have a very large footnote where we try to explain what it means, and as I said, it has a a constitutional interpretation by the Court of Justice is one element, that's the first one that ticks in, and then the constitutional discourse just doesn't arrive for political reasons, it just doesn't arrive simultaneously. It's there in the 50s, but then it actually comes back in the late 70s or early 80s, and I would say it's reinforced more by the single European Act and the success of integration. Um, and it comes out, I would say in 81, you know, it's a little bit an accident, I would say, that, that it comes there. But the power it gets is not accidental, of course. Um, and we call it constitutional practice, as I hinted at in the discussion, simply because I think what, the, what this new historiography have, have really uncovered, and, and I would even say demonstrated, are really the close links between the battle over European federalism in the 50s and also in the 50s and, and 60s and 70s, actually, and up to the Maastricht Treaty, if you like. The battle over what should the soul of Europe be? Should it be a federalization process? Should the community go in a federal direction? Or would it be rather the kind of state-led, governmental-led community that we argue that it eventually actually become? So in a way, you can say the battle over federalism, the European federalists, at least in the Maastricht Treaty and in the process, if you look at it historically, they do lose out at key points in this history. But the the, the emergence of a constitutional practice are really a 
a child of the Helstein Commission. And that commission had a, really wanted to federalize uh, the system, right? So that's basically, that's basically the story. So there's a clear link between the constitutional practice and the history of European federalism. And I think that's really indisputable. That's not saying that everybody who, of the lawyers who supported constitutional concepts of European law are federalist, not at all, because the concept was very smart, or even the new legal order was perhaps even smarter, because you could bring lawyers in who may believe in a strong Europe, but not a federal Europe, and they could kind of live with the concept, right? So, okay, back to the story. So what, what we argue really, and I think what we have shown uh, to a large extent, and together with Antoine Wuxi and others, is really that the Hallstein Commission, they, they really launch this federalist agenda and, and um, they are really the fathers, if you like, of the constitutional interpretation of European law. And from then on, it actually, uh, there's a emergent, uh, or you can say from the 60s onwards, there's a close alliance of the three supranational institutions in the decades that follow, so the parliament, the commission and the court, and they all back a constitutional interpretation of European law all through the 60s, 70s and 80s. And in addition, there's an emerging field of European law academia that finds it rational in, this, in the 1960s as a subset of the legal discipline in the constitutional interpretation or the new legal order. Um, and then that new field that emerges in the 60s and 70s generally tend to legitimate, legitimate the case law of the ECJ. And eventually, of course, it was from this academic field, it was from this parallel track, if you like, that the constitutional discourse eventually would re-emerge in, in the early 80s. So all in all, the constitutional practice constituted an important self-empowerment strategy of the supranational institutions, justified through law, their political ambitions for European unification and perhaps even federalization. I think what's also laid bare by historiography is really that attention is created by the emergence and consolidation of the constitutional interpretation of European law, because European federalism, as I said, really did not succeed to take off as a major political step towards creating a fully autonomous or federally structured uh, European community. And I think what we demonstrate also is the member states were only, maybe f um, mainly for re reasons, were only reluctantly coming to terms with the constitutional practice of European law, and that actually deep into the 80s we have a deep-seated resistance existing both among certain national governments and more generally within national administrations and courts. And the lack of reaction from national governments to the constitutional interpretation by the ECJ and later discourse, we can actually show is caused by a split in the council between member states. So this split secured the ECJ against intervention by the council and by uh, an anonymous front of national governments. But it also meant that the council could never agree even until the Maastricht Treaty, to begin to codify the constitutional doctrines. So instead, I would argue, instead of uh, what in much of the early legal and also political science literature was assumed a progressive acceptance of, of the constitutional interpretation of European law, I would rather argue that we see the breaking point and then we can discuss is it 78, 79, or is it the single European Act itself? I think. I think if you look at the late 70s, early 80s, it's not like EU law is, is being generally accepted by the member <coughs> states. It really is the single European Act that makes it, that locks it in. And that's when it becomes a success. Uh, but then, of course, because it's locked in a single market project, because the single market project is so immensely important, it becomes the highest national interest in the late 80s, if you want to talk uh, about national interests. So that means, in de facto, national administrations and courts have to accept how the legal order works, more or less. They have to take it more seriously than they have. They cannot ignore it as much as they actually did in the 70s. But on the other hand, then we get the Maastricht Treaty and the judgment, for example, by the German Constitutional Court, where you actually see a counter-reaction, where the majority of member states, when they negotiate Maastricht, they do not follow the De Law Commission and kind of go in the federalized direction. They actually end up saying, no, uh, we do a pillar structure. We, we isolate the commission and the court in the first pillar. We, do, we launch new methods of cooperation. And then comes out, of course, the German Constitutional Court and other high courts and actually say, okay, we de facto accept what had happened and that it's locked in now. 
but the constitutional claim, we don't believe in that, right? That's really not it. So there's a reaction, and we would, I think I would argue that that's, that is a long continuity of deep-seated deep uh, critique of the court and resistance that actually comes out here. Um, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. All right. Uh, and then in the post-Maastricht uh, era, I'm less of an expert. That's why daughter has been part of the of the paper, of course. But there, the argument really is that um, the political actors of European integration continue to oppose so unwanted jurisprudence, created new modes of governance beyond the judicial realm, limiting the scope and relative importance of the ECDA's uh, interpretation. And the failed attempts of the constitutional treaty, of course, did not change this trend. In a way, it reconfirmed the defeat of those who wanted more. And also in the internal market where constitutional practice was otherwise found to be strongest, the EU legislature pushed back controversial legal decision and managed to modify the implications. So we see that the court also at times accept and adjust to political corrections in the post Maastricht um, Maastricht uh, uh, days. So let me then finally revisit a little bit the mainstream interpretation of how European law developed from 1950 to the present day. And there we mainly play ball with Joseph Weiler, Karen Alder, Sweet Stone, and those classic works. And it, that may be a slight mistake, but I would try to justify. It's not simply that we haven't read any literature since. What we look for as historian and political scientists, if mm -hmm. we look at analysis of uh, the period from, let's say, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, what were the dynamics, what were the causalities of how European law developed, then we look for literature that actually offer something on those causalities or links or who were the actors, right? So that's why I still think that in many respects, uh, these works by Karen Alda and Alex Don Sweet and, uh, and Weiler still stands at, w at st some of the most explicit in the interdisciplinary field of European law, where it comes to how come it happened, right? How did constitutionalization, as they call it, happen, right? And I think our account offers a mixture of revision and refinement to Weiler's famous work, for example. And of course, none of these people could go to archives, so it's not a, it's not a critique in that sense. It's simply, hopefully, a, a refinement of, of what we can offer. So I think historical research there give a, a new understanding of which actors and institutions promoted the constitutional practice that goes beyond the court-centered explanations may be offered by Weiler, right? So it was this broad supranational alliance by all the three supranational institutions combined with EU law academics. Um, and we also describe in new empirical detail how member states reacted to the development, both at European and state level. Something Weiler writes in the early 90s, for example, is that because the council doesn't say anything against it explicitly, it's because they accepted it. And we know now that no, it was because the council was split. They could not agree to curb the court, but they could also not agree to codify. And when it came to the Maastricht Treaty, right, the majority, the majority were really to curb, let's say, the constitutional ambition. So, and another thing is that I think we get a glimpse of, but which we require more research, because simply if you want to do archive-based studies and study one member state's reception, it's something you can use five, six years on to do it right. So it's not easy to produce a lot of national reception studies. But I think what we see are really how deep-seated national administrations resist European law. That the impact of European law until the mid-80s are really limited in, in practical terms and in many respects, because national administrations ignore it. You know, I, I read this fantastic comment by the Belgian uh, Ministry of Finance to the Le Ski Judgment in 1971, right? Where, where even the Court de Cassation of Belgium argues, now the government has to pay this firm because you broke European law. You have to pay indemnity to them, right? You have to pay the money back. And the finance ministry, ah, these courts, who cares? You know, we are not going, this is a substantial amount of money. We're not going to have lawyers tell us whether we should pay that or not. Mm -hmm. So in five years, they refuse to pay. And the foreign ministry of Belgium, they argue, oh God, you are hurting our reputation in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just to show you the kind of limitations you find in administrative politics. Um, 
I think another thing which is, 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 is maybe interesting in relationship to, uh, um, um, let me see. Yeah, okay, I'll close. Um, I think just a final remark and then I'll just stop, uh, but hopefully you manage to read the paper. I will say if you, for example, look at the dy internal di causal dynamics of, of constitutionalization through Article 177 and preliminary references, which is really at the core of a lot of theorizing, right? You have also talking about lower courts that goes into the picture. You have Alex Stone Sweet with the firms that want to liberalize and go to court and then they get a, a case law that liberalizes the market and then more firms go, etc. So it's kind of self-reinforcing. I think what we find as historians is that the, the phenomenon of Article 77 is really an overblown phenomenon. It, there's no real societal kind of demand for legal integration until the 80s, I would argue. And what we actually discovered and begin to discover now is that there are so many repeat players about lawyers and the core and the key judges who are producing these cases. So that if you take uh, Pavone's work on Italy, you will get that out of the first 80 preliminary references in Italy, right? Uh, 64 or so were produced by the four repeat players. Catalano was one of them, a member of the legal, former member of the legal service was another one. And so you can see, so the argument I present here, which is a little bit tentative, but I think will end up being the argument about the dynamics of preliminary references from the late or the, 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 the early 60s to around the early 80s, would be that what who really promotes this are a core of lawyers mostly, but also uh, a little bit judges who have a pro-European agenda, who want to develop European law for ideological reasons, but of course also for professional reasons. Thank you very much. The reading of your talk, which is supposed to be contrafactual, but at the end I think we converge because when you talk about constitutionalization, you see, I'm a historian, I look at that, I'm value free. And not value free, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> but <laughs> not the liberals. Yeah, yeah, not the liberals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what you, what you also, well, if you do that and you look at the European Court and the, what they call constitutionalization of Europe, you always also observe the deconstitutionalization of an alternative vision, the head of tradition, for instance, because this becomes, so to speak, the out, outlawed uh, element. And when you, at the end of the of your talk, talked about what is the highlight or what is the impact of the, uh, the reference procedures. Who is coming to the court, Rewe in Germany, and all these really strategic players. And then you realize, okay, it is indeed constitutionalization. However, it's economic constitutionalization. Constitutionalizing, sorry. I link you also to, to uh, to Augustine with these remarks. But I think your stories are rich enough, they cover both, only that you say, I care about the European process. But I would say you also do implicitly, or sometimes explicitly, tell us what happens at the national level, or what happens to the chances of seeing a more uh, Rechtsstaat tradition at the European level. That has no chance implicitly. I think that's part of your story. No, no, sure, sure. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. It, it, I think it, I think it's it, I think it's exceedingly complex. I think where we are right now, the historians and what which we try to sum up, and Bill and me are editing a book, which hopefully soon can get done and get out with a, a more rich version of these results, is that we have a, we have some basic stories we can tell you, which are pretty well documented and where we can show certain elements which are, which are basically presented in the article. But how to, how to go from there yeah. and interpret in a broader sense into European history, whether you want to, let's say, look at the national social democratic models of constitutionalism or how you want to connect that story. I think that's still very open and I'm not, I'm not, uh, I cannot provide you with any clear answers here yet on, on that. But I think we have certain things about the causality of the, how the constitutional practice was established by whom and why and what they were thinking uh, and their connections to European federalism or European and self-empowerment of institutions, etc. But also the, the national side and how that battle were fought. But I think, yeah, I think one thing which I didn't manage in the, in the, in the, art, or in the presentation, of course, was 
that, that I think the story we are telling is really one of that when the constitutional practice was fulfilled, let's say, both an interpretation, a legal system that lawyers will tell me do look like a constitution and actually works like it, and a discourse to go with it, God, then we are close, aren't we? Right before Maastricht, and then came Maastricht. And that was a defeat, I think, for that vision. So, so I think the story ends up with this kind of doubleness, right? On the one hand, it really is a defeat for the constitutional and federalization aspiration with the Maastricht Treaty. On the other hand, and that's the complexity of history, on the other hand, the single market process locks in the legal order. So what is that kind of mix for a result, right? So you get a, a legal order that looks like, it works like constitution to some extent, that is locked in because of the single market, not because it convinced anybody for legal reasons or political reasons, but simply by historical accident, it's locked into the internal market at the same time as the member state governments actually choose a less federal, federal way, right? Yeah. I, I try to be very short sure because we should have a coffee break very yeah, soon. Yeah, so, and in a way, Morten will be familiar with this sort of um, comments uh, because I commented on a previous version of this paper. But I think when I feel uneasy when I read a paper is when it makes claims about the nature of law from from outside the law, so to say. So you want to prove that the constitutional practice has never succeeded because the member states never accepted it fully. Who cares in constitutional law? Because the people we have to ask and look at are constitutional lawyers, not the member states, not the governments. Of course, it depends a lot on what counts, what makes a legal order to be a constitutional legal order. But I think as long as there is a lot of people in the field who take it as a constitutional thing and they think about it, conceptualize it as a constitutional thing, then it is to large measure successful. So you can you know, gather lots of evidence and I think lawyers do not contest it. So in that sense, the paper seems to me sort of overplaying what it achieves because what you say is not so radical for lawyers because yes, we know that uh, government, it's the same to say, political constitutionalism and rights-based constitutionalism. If you ask at the constitutional court, and now I talk about national conceptions of constitutional, then of course constitutional justices will tell you that's the conception of the constitution we want to have. If you ask in the government, people in the government will tell you different things, but it doesn't mean that rights-based constitutionalism is not successful. So I think there are limits to what you do in the paper. Sure, many limits. I, I would say, in no, it's not that radical. It's, it's a subtle revision of how you probably should understand the history of European law from 1950 to, say, uh, the, uh, the early 1990s in terms of who were the key actors, what were the processes at stake, where did you find resistance, how did, how did member state, how did the national governments act, what happened in the council. Those sort of questions, that's what it gives. And it, there it gives a revision of certain let's say, interpretations have existed by Weiler also and others, right? About this kind of process and what it is. And that's not so, I'm not saying that's, uh, that this is a complete revision and all the rest was rubbish. I'm not going to it because it's not true and this, it does make sense. But, but it is a revision. It's based on a lot of archival work. It's empirically well documented, so it's well taking notice of. So that's one part of it. What comes then about the constitutional practice? You could say it's our clumsy attempt to conceptualize a social phenomenon that is part of that history. And then when we talk about that it doesn't succeed, of course, as I just said, it's a, it's a mixed story. In a way it succeeds, right? Because the legal order is locked into the single market. And as you will tell me as a lawyer, the legal order, it, in many respects, if everybody says it's the constitution of the, of the lawyers and it works like it, then that is a, a sort of constitutional legal order that has been locked into the EU. But at the same time, the federalized, the federal vision, the, the, the twin of the constitutionalization process, that twin has been pushed outside the door by the Maastricht Treaty, right? So in that sense, it's a, it's a defeat. And that's basically, that's basically the argument. Then you can say, does that matter at all? Does that, you know, it was locked in. Now it's there, we can sit here and talk about constitutionalism. A lot of EU lawyers 
are raised like that now. It, it, it's, it's, it's just a reality, isn't it? But of course, you, you know as well as me that if you go on the man on the street to Augustine Sky outside and ask, is this Europe part of it? Do we have a European constitution? He will probably, in Denmark, they will say no. We, they, that was a no, wasn't it? It was voted down. So, uh, so the question of whether the federal ambition, or let's say the, the, the popular constitutional vision, of whether that broke through or not, I think that's a fair question. And that's where we actually argue that it doesn't look like that has happened yet. August. No. To make, to make the point very clear, if it, if it got wrong, I admire deeply the work that you have been doing. That's, that's not the question. The question is how you can push it even further. Yes, no, I understand. And, and pushing it even further requires, and I think, j just one point. On this issue of whether it was 78 or was 86, I, I'm not saying this is a, I mean, it's arbitrary where you put the, where you put the, the thing. But, 86 is relevant if you are thinking about the developments that were happening regarding ECJ decisions. If you look to the European exchange rate mechanism, for example, that is out of the radar because it's not judicialized and has been, I mean, monetary union has been very lately judicialized, then the question is that 78 is the breaking point. Why? You take a decision that is very not, uh, very innocent in, in appearance, that is that you peg your currency. But pegging your currency, you take the economic decisions that imply that it does not matter what the, 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 the letter of the law is. Because you will have to follow the, the, the monetary policy of the Bundesbank. Why? Because if not, the markets will take a vengeance on you. And the question is that the only way out is either you agree a devaluation with the others or you follow the Bundesbank. Then the Bundesbank happens to be the only uh, central bank uh, that is independent at that point and is following certain policy. Therefore, the decision to peg the currencies I within the exchange rate mechanism means that you opt for a certain monetary policy. Mm -hmm. Is Maastricht in a nutshell before Maastricht? Uh, which proves the point, I think, uh, of, of the question of what you look at some things because the lawyers have been looking at these things, but there are other things on the table that the lawyers, we don't look at them because there have not been changes to the legal rules. But de facto, the rules have changed because we have created the economic conditions under which it's a matter of codification when mastery comes for, for, a, for, for quite a lot of the stuff. The, the rules were not there, but in practice they were there. This is the reason that they were accepted relatively easily because there was no alternative. So that's the only point. We started five minutes late, and now we are six minutes late. So the rest is voluntary self-exploitation in American <laughs> style. <laughs> if you decide that you want to say, you know, Mike, and then you. So th thanks. I think you tell a very persuasive story, and we can disagree on the, the, the detail. But I have a more simple question, mm -hmm. um, which is maybe it's sort of methodological in some way to approaching this in a, a positivist uh, a manner. Where, where is the role of uh, ideology in utopia in this story? How, how, how do we, I mean, are you, is it a, are you trying to break this down in a way that avoids that element or, well, so tell me. Oh, another question also? Oh. Yes, please. Yeah. Just a reaction to question your um, equation between the federal, degree of federalism and constitutionalization. You know, one can imagine constitutionalization, what that is different it's back to Augustine's path not taken. Of course. You, know, you can constitutionalize a different, in the Platonic world of, of, of political order, something else can be constitutionalized. And similarly, you, could also, you can also say that in the tradition of cloaking, um, you know, federalism can advance without a constitution. So, and indeed, that game, that play has been, I think, very important. So I, I just wanted to come and question on this correlation. You should start with the Eucalypt. So I think, I, I think you're perfectly right. And the more I got into reading a little bit about what is a constitution and how do you guys actually think about this, right? The complexity <laughs> of it is really mind-boggling, I must say, because Clearly, it, constitution can be of something new. It can be a process. It can be a breakthrough. It can be, if we look at it historically, right? So it can be many things. So, so the argument here is not, it's not a value adjustment at all. We just don't see that the constitutional practice, as we try to call it as neutrally as possible, that has developed, 
uh, has really made the big breakthrough. That's, that's, basically, that's basically it. And you can say, okay, in the Lisbon Treaty, is it, maybe you will have to correct me, when finally primacy is codified, isn't it, in the Lisbon Treaty? But that same treaty then strips all the language away of the constitutional <laughs> language. So it's a little bit, oh, okay, so finally, one of the key doctrines are really put in a treaty, <laughs> but then the language disappeared. <laughs> so just, okay, back to, uh, to you, uh, Michael. Uh, and I think, no, uh, we tried, and that's something I think we took more seriously than Polylexis and Vaucher and the others, who were very, very much about the profession of lawyers and the self-interest of lawyers. We, in, in our historiography, we have taken uh, the role of ideology very seriously, and that's why I say I think we actually demonstrated quite clearly the links between European federalism and the emergence of a constitutional practice. And so we have been, through primary sources, through sources that really, diaries, etc., you can really get into the minds of people like Michel Godet and see how he was thinking about Europe. We have written biographical articles about Eric Stein and Godet, for example, where you can really see how the links are between ideology and the role, how they view law and how they develop law and practice. So I would say no, it's on the contrary, it, you know, the constitutional or the new legal order, it sounds so boring, but it was really born out of uh, you know, a, a wish to create Europe, to self-empower it, and, and also to bring it on a potentially federal path. And then there was one final <coughs> remark with you, Augustin. I, I, I'm all for using the broader historical picture, and I think I try to do that with 86. You have done it uh, with reference to the EMS. I, have, I was just to a seminar with Laurent Wallousier, who has written a very nice book on, on economic history of the 70s, looking at it from a European perspective, but integrating international organizations. And what he has demonstrated, more or less clearly, actually, is that European leaders from the early 70s to the Sinclair Act are on the look for various solutions to the crisis and how to reinvigorate their countries. And what is interesting with that story is how open it is. It's not a, a, a single path European integration road, as we probably believe when we deal with EU law. It's, they were actually searching various other options that could have been a replacement of the single act. So they also looked elsewhere for solutions. They didn't succeed. And then in the end, in 84, 85, they focused on the single act reform. And then that put Europe on track. Then it happened in the EC framework. But it was not inevitable at all. So it, it, then we can play with, well, for, is it 78, is it 84, is it 80? But it's in that period, at least, something transformative happens that has decided the Europe we are in today.